Hello and welcome to the video lecture about safety and security in the vet office. So you can refer to your textbook for um, more information, your front office management textbook on pages 358 to 396. Uh, safety and security is covered, but I will give you a warning that it is written from a, an American perspective. So in America, they have the Occupational Safety and Health Administration or OSHA. Um, in Canada, we do not have that. We do, however, have uh, the Manitoba Workplace Safety and Health Act. So I have put a link to it here if you'd like to familiarize yourself with it. Uh, and then as well, I put a link to the Safe Work Manitoba website. So a lot of the um, requirements are fairly similar, um, but I just wanted to point out that the textbook is definitely American and these sites are gonna give you more accurate uh, Manitoba specific information in terms of what standards uh, hospitals have to be compliant with. So again, this is a, an OSHA thing. So this is from America. But um, there are certain um, criteria that a hospital has to meet to be meeting those OSHA hazard communication standards. So in the States then, uh, to be compliant, the hospital has to have a safety manager. That safety manager is responsible for training the team and ensuring that the standard requirements are met. Uh, they, are, um, they also need to have a written safety plan, a summary of all hazardous chemicals. Um, they have to have those SDSs or safety data sheets available for every chemical in the building. All chemicals have to be labor labeled accurately. Um, there has to be an explanation of the labeling system. They need to have an emergency evacuation protocol and they need to have a training program that includes how to use PPE properly. So PPE is personal protective equipment and monitoring devices and the uh, employees have to be trained on the hazards of the practice. So those are officially OSHA standards, um, but it's not that far off what has to be happening in, um, in Canada. So the employer's responsibilities, the employer is responsible for providing a safe work environment for the employees. They have to set and enforce safety rules uh, and have a workplace rights poster uh, someplace in the building. Um, so it's one thing to have a rule, but they need to actually enforce those rules as well. Uh, employees need to be informed of job risks and they need to be trained on the use of PPE and they have to have that PPE provided to them. Employees then are responsible with reading and understanding the workplace rights and the rules. They have to then comply with the safety rules. They have to use the PPE that's provided and they're obligated to report hazardous conditions, injuries, and if they do get injured to seek treatment immediately. So there's lots of common workplace hazards. I'm not gonna go over these one by one at this time because I have a PowerPoint to share with you that goes into all those. Um, and then preventative measures. Again, uh, I'm gonna get pretty into these in our um, PowerPoint that's coming up right away. But uh, just to sum it up, um, I'm just looking. Yeah, I think everything is on our um, on, in, our, in our PowerPoint, except for maybe regular maintenance of equipment. Actually, no, I would say that's probably in the PowerPoint as well. And then WIMIS and SDS training. So uh, WIMIS training is something that you do uh, through school here, and then you should get that updated. I think it's annually, something like that. Uh, security measures to deter criminals. I talk about in our PowerPoint. I also talk about pass. Um, okay, so evacuation plans, we talk about them a little bit. But basically when we're creating an evacuation plan, we need to post signs in the building that list the escape routes, the locations of fire extinguishers, where the compressed gas is located, what phone numbers to call, and the escape plan details. So in Winnipeg, the emergency number to call is 911, easy peasy. Um, you should also probably call like the hospital owner and alert them that there's an emergency going on, but 911 needs to be your first phone call. Um, if possible, we're going to remove the pets that are in the clinic. 
dogs on leashes, cats in kennels. Uh, clinics tend to have a lot of extra kennels on hand in case there's an emergency. Um, once we have them outside of the building, uh, it's going to be a better idea to, I put in quotes there, store them in employee vehicles for safekeeping. And that's because we don't want them getting stressed out being outside. Uh, if we can keep them in the, in the cars, they'll probably be a lot more calm and quiet. Um, that being said, you know, if it's hot outside, obviously roll down the windows, etc. Um, ultimately though, human safety is uh, our number one priority, um, unfortunately. So if you are not able to get to the pets to remove them or if it's not safe to do so, we're gonna leave that to the emergency response crew. Obviously we would rather not have animals die in our clinic in an emergency, um, but if something does come up that we cannot handle, we, we're gonna leave it to the emergency um, response people, okay? Okay, so that's, that's all I have in the notes. Let's talk about our um, PowerPoint now. So I made a PowerPoint that tells us all about common workplace hazards in the veterinary hospital. So again, uh, your textbook reading is page 358 to 396. Um, but I got into more detail on those common, um, uh, common risk factors. So number one uh, is zoonotic disease. So a uh, definition of zoonotic disease is an illness that can be transmitted from animals to humans. Um, so uh, in your textbook, it says that there are 1400 zoonotic diseases with 60% crossing species. Uh, so examples of things that you might encounter in the vet clinic could be the rabies virus, uh, could be the ringworm fungus, visceral larva migrans is uh, from roundworm, cutaneous larva migrans is from ringworm, or not ringworm, sorry, uh, hookworm, uh, leptospirosis, that's a bacteria, and there's many, many more. Um, so on page 360, there's a table, 21-1, and that provides you with a list of all the different illnesses. Um, you don't need to memorize those, but I think it's a good idea to have an awareness of them. So I, I at the very least, I would peruse the list. Um, but you should know what kind of things you should be uh, on the lookout for. So the risk of zoonotic disease is contracting a zoonotic disease, right? Um, obviously, we, do, we don't want to get sick at work, right? Uh, we also don't want to risk spreading a zoonotic disease to another animal or to another human. So we want to be aware of that, making sure we're, we're not contracting it, making sure we're not bringing it home and spreading it around. So to prevent zoonotic disease, we want to be knowledgeable about the diseases common in our area. So I listed a few of those on the previous or two slides previous. Um, knowledge is power, right? So if you're aware of them, you can, uh, you can be prepared to prevent them. You should make sure that you're up to date on your rabies, tetanus, and flu vaccines. Um, so rabies uh, and tetanus are both things you can get from animal bites. And there are some flu viruses that are um, zoonotic. So keeping up to date on your flu vaccine will prevent you from getting sick and also can, um, can prevent you from spreading things to other animals or other people in the clinic. Uh, we should be sterilizing equipment making sure that things are clean in between animals. We want to make sure that we're practicing excellent hygiene. We want to be washing our hands often in the clinic. Um, I wash my hands after every single patient and uh, sometimes before a patient, if it's been a while since I washed my hands too, right? Um, so I wash my hands constantly while I'm working. Um, so in, yeah, in the vet clinic, just talking about uh, hand washing. So I wash my hands anytime I've touched an animal. I wash my hands like before going in to do something. If um, like if I'm gonna do like a clean procedure, like placing a catheter or something, I'm gonna wash my hands. I wash my hands before I go to the bathroom and after I go to the bathroom. Uh, you wash your hands before and after you eat, right? You wash your hands often. Anytime you touch something, like if I clean something in the clinic, I wash my hands after. You do a lot of hand washing in, in, in the vet hospital. Uh, so you should make sure that you do not eat or drink in lab or treatment areas. So food and drink should just be consumed in um, like a lunchroom or an office. Uh, they shouldn't be anywhere else in the clinic because there's potential for the food and drink to become contaminated. 
We want to avoid um, an infective patient if we are immune compromised. Um, so immune compromised people uh, typically have some kind of immune disorder uh, or um, are pregnant. So if you are pregnant and working in the vet clinic, make sure you're avoiding patients that have a potential zoonotic disease. When you do have to handle an infected animal, you should at least wear exam gloves, if not other protective equipment as well. We should be practicing excellent restraint to avoid bites and scratches. And if we are exposed, we should be seeking medical attention immediately. Um, we know already that uh, if we catch illnesses early, we have better treatment outcomes. Uh, same deal uh, with us, right? Um, not just pets, with us as well. So I'm sure you guys are pretty up to date on washing your hands, uh, what with all this COVID stuff. But if you are not, as a reminder, this is how we wash our hands. You're going to wet your hands with water first and then apply soap. You need to lather and scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. Sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, Happy Birthday, uh, or the ABCs um, to get those hands nice and clean. So I always say to my kids, I say fronts and backs and in-betweens, that's how you get your hands all clean. So we're rubbing our hands together, uh, we're getting the back, so rub our hands like this, I get the backs of my hands, I go up my wrists, um, I get in between all my fingers and you should wash and scrub in your nail areas. So make sure you're getting all uh, areas of your hand. So between your fingers, under your nails, tops of your hands, make sure you're getting all those places. Apparently the most neglected hand washing spot is like right here on the thumb. So make sure you're really getting in all those spots when you're washing. Once you've done your good lather up, uh, you can do a rinse for 10 seconds and then you're gonna turn off the tap preferably with a paper towel if you have, and then you can dry your hands. Little pro tip for you, drying your hands in the vet clinic, doing a pat dry is better than a rub dry. Uh, it just damages your hands, your skin, if you're rubbing them all the time with towels. Um, also, when you're washing your hands, we don't wanna use hot water because that damages your skin as well. Uh, so just using warm water um, and hand soap to, to clean those hands. Uh, so we're gonna do that many many times throughout the day. Oh, I'll also make a note because you should be cleaning like in your nail areas and um, You should keep your nails fairly short when you're working at the vet clinic um, Because underneath your nails is a great place for microorganisms to hide and hang out And then later when you're like picking your teeth after eating popcorn at night or something you totally putting that stuff right into your mouth So make sure that you are uh, keeping your nails fairly short when you're working so this is just a little bit of a reminder as well that part of the veterinary code of ethics is to protect the public from zoonotic disease, which means that if an animal has a zoonotic illness, we have to advise the client that it is zoonotic and how they can prevent it because it could be a legal issue if they get sick. So just a reminder on that. So our next risk is animal bites and scratches. And I have a little uh, thing here, it's from a lawyer, the bulldog lawyers, but I, I like the little, um, the picture on it, right? Animal bites on the job are no joke. It doesn't matter if you work inside or outside, animal bites are a common on the job industry, especially when you're working with animals in vet medicine. So bites can cause a variety of injuries and illnesses, including tendon damage, broken bones, infection, cat scratch fever, rabies, those are all potential things transmitted through bites. It says here Lyme disease, but that's false. I put this over it. You can't get Lyme disease from a bite from an animal. You can get Lyme disease from a bite from a deer tick and that's it. Um, so I put a big X over that, but the rest of it is nice. So um, it is true that animal bites can cause a lot of damage to you. So an injury, uh, those injuries can get infected, especially if it's a cat bite. And of course, there's a potential for the spread of zoonotic disease. So none of those things are good. Uh, one of my instructors when I was in school had gotten bit by a cat uh, right on like this part of her joint on the finger. And um, she was like, oh, I'm sure it's no big deal and ignored it. And then um, her entire joint got really infected and she had to be hospitalized for a week on IV antibiotics. And her finger still doesn't bend properly and the joint is really uh, like swollen and enlarged. And that was years ago, like years prior to me knowing her that that happened. 
So um, cat bites especially we should really take seriously. Um, I've only been, I haven't been bitten too, too often, um, but I've been bitten a couple times by cats. I'm trying to think two, three times maybe where it's been a, like a fairly bad bite. And every time I've gone to the doctor uh, to get some antibiotics, uh, just as a preventative. And then another just side story here, my, and this isn't anything to do with um, working in a vet clinic, but my husband's auntie got bit by a cat and, um, and uh, it got infected and then they treated it. And anyway, she, she ended up in a coma from the cat bite because she was uh, so seriously sick from it. So um, it is something that we should take seriously. We wanna be uh, careful about animal bites. So how can we prevent animal bites? Uh, first and foremost, we need to learn and understand animal body language. Most bites happen because people aren't recognizing that the animal is escalating. Uh, so we need to be able to read that animal's body language to see when they're going to possibly start biting. It's true that sometimes animals do bite with no warning, but the vast majority of the time they will give you warnings. Um, so fortunately for us, we are going to cover that in our restraint course. We learn all about animal body language. Uh, so we want to practice excellent restraint skills uh, when we're handling animals. We want to make sure that we're always on the ball when it comes to restraint. Again, we will cover that in our restraint class. Uh, we also need to make sure that we have excellent communication between staff members. So that includes during restraint procedures and, um, and even when the animal's just in a kennel or something. We need to have warning signs in place that an animal is potentially aggressive or dangerous, okay? Um, lots of clinics have kind of like codes for if an animal is aggressive. Uh, for the ones that I've seen, they're usually like a red line, which means we just put a red line underneath the animal's name or like a red circle around the name. And that indicates like that's kind of our code in the hospital that this is an aggressive animal. We also want to make sure that we're using our available restraint tools, things like muzzles uh, if needed, or, um, you know, like make sure we have leashes around, uh, cat muzzles, cat bags, cat towels, etc. Again, we'll learn all about these in restraint. And then uh, lastly, if we do have animals that are um, aggressive and trying to hurt us, they are great candidates for sedation. Um, we do not want animals in the vet clinic becoming so scared or so angry that they want to bite us. Sedation is a good tool to have in our back pockets to use if, um, if it gets to that point. Uh, so um, if you are ever bit by an animal, we want to do some um, you know, disease prevention here. Uh, so usually what we're going to do is wash the bite or scratch area with soap and water. We should let it bleed for a while, okay? We don't want to try to stop the bleeding right away. Um, bleeding can help to wash out things that are in the wound, right? So if we let it bleed under running water um, for a little bit, let, uh, let everything out and then try to stop the bleeding after. Like I'll honestly wash my hands under, under water for like good 5-10 minutes after a bite or a scratch. Uh, then I'll try to stop the bleeding. You can apply an antibiotic ointment um, and then cover the area with a bandage or um, sterile gauze if needed, right? If it's a larger wound. And then, um, well, it says you could offer, this is for children, clearly. It says offer the child acetaminophen or ibuprofen for pain. So yeah, if you're having pain in the area, you can certainly take um, an NSAID drug to reduce the pain. And then you should seek medical care if the bite was from a wild or a stray animal, you don't know their rabies status. If the animal isn't up to date on rabies, you should seek, uh, seek care. If the animal was acting strange, potentially indicating rabies, definitely get that care. If a bite has broken skin, if it's on the face, head, neck, hand, foot, or near a joint, just go to the doctor. Um, if it becomes red, hot, swollen, or painful, those are signs of infection. They need to be seen by the doctor. Um, or if you're not up to date on your tetanus shot, which you should be if you're working in uh, a vet clinic. Um, so you basically just go seek uh, medical care if you're bit. I mean, scratches, I feel like scratches are a little bit of a different thing. Like cat scratches happen fairly frequently, even with friendly cats, because sometimes people just plain don't cut their cat's nails. Um, but if, you're, if you have a bite, I think it's a good idea to get that checked. 
Um, okay, so our next risk, um, our next potential hazard is medical waste. So medical waste, I have a definition here. There's two different things that count as medical waste. So the first thing is things that are called sharps. Uh, that's just kind of like a jargon term, sharps. It includes things like needles. So basically these guys all up here, right? Needles, scalpel blades. Um, it does include glass slides and cover slips as well. Um, so basically anything that could poke you or cut you. Um, medical waste also includes the animal parts that are removed during surgery. Um, so like this is uh, uterus and ovaries that were removed. Um, it can also include byproducts of birth or miscarriage. Okay, so those things as well uh, have potential to be uh, risks. And so what are the risks? For those animal parts, the risk is exposure to zoonotic disease, um, especially um, like uh, products of miscarriage. Um, th those Lots of times animals might miscarry because of a zoonotic disease called brucellosis. Um, and that is uh, zoonotic. So we wanna be careful handling those kind of parts. Um, and then with sharps, uh, obviously injury. So needle stick injury or scalpel injuries. Um, if it's just a clean needle or a clean scalpel, um, injury is like the biggest risk. Uh, but if it is a used scalpel or needle, we have potential exposure to harmful drugs and potential exposure to zoonotic disease. So those things are um, scary and we don't want those. So um, I've got a couple stories for you. <laughs> so one time I was working in the vet clinic and I got a pretty bad needle stick injury. So I was going to pull blood from a dog's jugular. So I'm like, it was a large dog on the floor. So I am sitting on the floor, um, like my shins are on the floor and I'm sitting down on my shins, like uh, uh, my bum's on my heels. So I'm trying to pull blood from this dog. I'm feeling the, the neck. And then all of a sudden it just like rears up like a horse kicking out and um, and like flicks the syringe um, out of its neck. And it goes flying like over in the air and then lands directly into my thigh, uh, just like a dart. And I was like, oh my God, what just happened? What do I do? It was terrifying. I was fine. It was fine. But that was... Um, I was definitely concerned about that. Uh, so that wasn't fun. That was a bad injury. Um, and then um, I just have a couple stories about scalpels. So scalpels are really sharp and they are uh, fairly dangerous um, in that they, I mean, they're designed to cut through um, like body tissue, right? So they can be definitely really dangerous. So I have two scalpel stories to share with you. Uh, so the first one is, um, my, uh, um, husband's father. So my father-in-law, he was working with a scalpel at work and he dropped it. Um, and I don't know if you guys have heard that saying, but like a falling knife has no handle as in don't try to catch something with a blade that's falling. Cause you're going to catch the blade. Um, but just like reflexes, he went to try to catch it by like clapping his knees together. So like bringing them together. Um, and he jammed the scalpel into his thigh. So he just missed like his femoral artery, which would have like killed him. So they are very sharp, just so you know. And then I have another story about scalpels where I had, um, I was working at the Humane Society and the vet there was coaching a student vet about doing surgery. And she was saying, never leave your scalpel on the patient. And she had set it down to show them what she, she meant and then kept talking and whatever. And I guess forgot that she had demoed this and then went to do, you know, more work there and um, managed to get the scalpel stuck into this part, like this fleshy part of her thumb. And it was just like her glove just filled with blood. And she was like, okay, I'm going to have to step out now. So that was really quite alarming. So again, making sure we're really handling sharps carefully. So how do we prevent injury from medical waste? Number one, we wanna use biohazard containers. So we wanna use those containers properly, which means that sharps go right into the sharps container um, and you do not um, you know, leave them on the ground or whatever. I always say an uncapped needle goes directly into someone's eye. Um, just like cap your damn needles, right? Put them in the biohazard containers. Um, you should be using proper biohazard containers. You shouldn't be using things like um, like peanut butter jars or milk jugs. 
uh, those aren't really considered very safe. We want properly marked biohazard containers. As well, it's not considered a uh, good practice to have small sharps containers that you collect into and then open them up and dump them into a large sharps container. There's a lot of potential there for injury and exposure that's just not necessary. So um, either have a large sharps container that you fill or fill all your small ones and then um, you know put them into the larger bucket but not dumping them, just putting the small bucket in. We wanna make sure we're not cutting off needles. So some, do I don't know, some doctors are trying to cut corners and make things cheaper. And one of the ways they feel like they can make things cheaper is by having less sharps in their sharps buckets so that when they send them for incineration, it's only, it's less frequent. So they don't have to pay for incineration as often. So one way to do that is to have like, cut off the sharp part and then throw out the rest of the syringe and needle hub. But that isn't safe to do. If you're cutting off needles, they have the potential to go flying through the air erratically. And as I've said before, uncapped needles are going directly into someone's eye. So that's not safe. And then as well, when you're cutting off needles, you're potentially aerosolizing everything that's in that needle. So um, like maybe potentially blood and then therefore zoonotic disease or harmful drugs. So don't cut off needles. The whole thing just goes into that sharps bucket. You don't cut them off. And then those sharps buckets get sent um, to uh, an incinerator to incinerate the biohazard waste. So with needles, please do not uncap needles with your mouths. Some people, I don't know, do they think they're cool? I don't know what it is, but they'll put the cap like this part of the needle in their mouth and they'll hold it in their mouth while they're feeling around for a vein. Then they'll bite the cap of the needle to pull the needle out of the cap to pull blood. Such a bad idea. A, it's not cool. You look stupid. B, you're putting things in your mouth. We just talked about zoonotic disease. One of the primary ways you're gonna get a zoonotic disease is uh, through oral absorption. So don't put things in your mouth, that's gross. And then secondly, you are uncapping a needle in your face. Why would you do that? That is so unsafe. So please, no uncapping needles with your mouth. Um, and then when we are recapping a needle, we wanna use the one-handed capping method. Um, Hopefully we'll be back in classroom and I'll be able to demo this for you, but I thought this is a good series of pictures. So your cap is gonna be on a horizontal surface and you just, get, you just using the one hand, slide that needle into the cap to catch it. You can tip that needle up so that the cap, you, you know, gravity gets that cap to slide over the needle. And then you can click it closed with your thumb, right? So you don't have to use two hands at all. Two-handed capping, hmm, I don't have a needle obviously here. Um, I'm just looking to see if I have like a pen and I do. So if this is a needle, right, and I'm two-handed capping, I have the potential to go right past and, and end up sticking my fingers with it. So two-handed capping isn't very safe, but a one-handed capping method is much safer. Okay, so our next risk in the clinic is ergonomics. So the risk from ergonomics is mostly physical injury. So if you're using a poor lifting technique, you could cause a back injury. If you're having to stand too long, you could injure your back, your feet, your legs. Um, and believe me, there are days when I don't get a chance to sit down at all in the vet clinic. So you're definitely on your feet a lot during the day. Uh, if you're doing a lot of computer use or other repetitive tasks with your hands, it could cause carpal tunnel syndrome. And in general, if you have a poorly designed workstation, just your whole body can hurt. So let's talk about lifting first. So to prevent uh, injuries from unsafe lifting, we want to make sure that we're team lifting pets over 18 kilograms. I have a video for you um, posted in Brightspace that is uh, from at Dove, and it shows the correct safe lifting technique with two people to team lift an animal. Um, you should, and. I don't know, 18 kilograms is just kind of like a guideline. If 18 kilograms is too much for you, you, you team lift any, any pet you need to, okay? Any pet. 
Um, when I was pregnant, I had lift restrictions placed on me. I couldn't lift anything over, uh, I think it was five kilograms. So like I was team lifting every animal because it's, um, it's, it makes your job harder if you have, um, if you have those kind of lift restrictions, but don't, don't push yourself be like Laura said, 18 kilograms. If 18 is too heavy for you, you go ahead and you get a team lift for any pet you need. We want to use a correct lifting technique. So we're lifting with our legs, not our back. So I have a little diagram here. First of all, don't attempt to lift beyond your strength capacity. You're not impressing anyone that you can pick up that 30 kilo dog. Um, all you're doing is potentially injuring yourself and not being available to uh, impress everyone with all your other amazing work skills. So please just be safe about lifting. Um, so you wanna stand close to whatever you're lifting. You wanna bring it close to your body. Do that squat down, bending at the knees, not at the waist. Pick it up with your legs and then stand up to that standing position, okay? Um, and even better, if we can avoid lifting altogether, we can avoid injuring our backs altogether. So if you work for a vet clinic that has a hydraulic lift table, that is a wonderful thing. They are uh, basically like an elevator table. It'll go up and down with a foot pedal. You can lower it to the floor, ask the animal to step on it, and then raise it on up. It's so nice. I love hydraulic lift tables. And then when we're talking about uh, like workstations, um, in the st places where people are gonna do extended standing, like in the surgery suite, it's a good idea to have those anti-fatigue mats. Um, if you've ever worked as a cashier, you probably had anti-fatigue mats at your uh, cash station. Um, and then we wanna make sure the workstations are designed ergonomically. So we want chairs that support our bodies properly. We want our keyboards and our monitors all placed properly. So this diagram kind of lays it all out for you. So um, you should be able to have your feet flat on the ground or on a foot rest, uh, whatever's more comfortable for you. You need the height of your chair so that you're about 90 degrees here, right? You need to adjust the backrest height so that you have lumbar support in your lower back. Um, and then the backrest is comfortable against the rest of the chair. Your elbows need to be bent at about 90 degrees close to the body. Uh, so if you have armrests, you can adjust those. You're, um, you shouldn't be typing like this, right? You should be typing at a neutral position, not like all hunched up to type. Um, your monitor should be about an arm's length away and it should be, t should be positioned so that it's around at eye level. So we shouldn't be looking down at our monitors. Uh, and then you should be able to hold your head neutral with your chin parallel to the ground. So this is an ideal workstation. So we wanna aim for that, uh, especially if we do have a lot of computer uh, and workspace uh, or workstation work to do. Okay, so radiology, radiology is x-rays. I have a nice uh, x-ray here for you as an example. So the risk of radiology is pretty strong. Uh, ionizing radiation is what produces x-rays and ionizing radiation also produces birth defects in babies, uh, little fetuses growing in bellies. It increases, or sorry, decreases fertility and it can cause cancer. So basically ionizing radiation attacks rapidly growing cells. Uh, so things like little fetuses that are growing bigger and bigger every day, um, children, uh, so no, nobody under 18 is even legally allowed in the x-ray room at uh, a vet facility. So just so you know, if you have any high school or younger age volunteers, they're not allowed to be involved in x-ray. Um, so we want to make sure that we're protecting ourselves properly when we're talking about radiology. So in radiology, there's the ALERA principle and ALERA stands for as low as reasonably achievable. Um, so we want to make use of distance, time and shielding to minimize exposure. So let's talk. What does that even mean? So distance. Uh, as you move away from the x-ray beam, your exposure decreases exponentially. Uh, so that means that every time you move a little bit further away, um, your exposure is effectively being cut by half or more. Um, and then our goal then is to place as much distance between us and the beam. So this is an x-ray machine. Obviously this is a dog getting an x-ray. So this is the x-ray head and the beam is coming through here. Okay, so this is the direction of the beam. 
Uh, so you can see that this guy isn't like hunched over the dog. He's standing straight. Um, he has his arms extended. He's got himself kind of as far away as he could be. Um, if you could take a step back further, even if you have a pretty cooperative dog and you can take a step back, do so. Even better, if you can leave the room entirely. Um, so there is something called hands-free x-ray. This is a fairly new invention in the uh, veterinary world. And because right now, currently, most people are doing um, hands-on x-ray, which means you have at least one, if not two people in the room taking an x-ray with the animal. So that's two people being potentially exposed to ionizing radiation that don't need to be there. Uh, so um, hands-free x-ray is a really great option if we can do that, because we can likely leave the room altogether and effectively have no exposure. So uh, for distance as well, uh, we can talk about collimation. So collimation reduces the exposure from the beam. So you can see here, so this light on the x-ray table shows what is in the x-ray. Um, so this is called the primary beam, is everywhere that the light touches. So you can see this light produces this x-ray. It took a picture of the whole head. If I needed a picture of just this portion of the head, I can go ahead and collimate and take just that picture. So here it is much smaller, there's the picture. So if I don't need all this, if this is the spot I'm interested in, I can take just that picture and I end up with less exposure overall. The animal gets less radiation exposure and we get less radiation exposure because um, we're, we're being protected by not having as much radiation bouncing off the pet. So uh, for time, we want to select the, the shortest possible time setting for exposures. Most clinics at this point have digital x-ray and they're so quick. It's like 0.2 of a millisecond is how long there's an exposure. So that's really, really short. But that adds up if you're taking a lot of x-rays in a day. Like there was one day I did multiple barium x-ray series, which means we're taking pictures of an animal every two hours. If you have multiple of those, you end up taking quite a few x-rays, plus whatever x-rays happening that day for other patients. Um, I took over 30 x-rays one day. That's insane. That's a lot of x-rays. So ideally, you should not be spending extra time in the radiology area. You should only be in there if you absolutely have to be. You shouldn't be hanging around when people are taking x-rays that you're not involved in. As well, ideally, we want to rotate who is involved in x-rays so that no, no one single person is getting a way higher dose than anyone else. We want to kind of spread it around. And then let's talk shielding. So shielding, we wanna make sure we are wearing proper PPE, so personal protective equipment. Our x-ray equipment is made of lead, okay? It's lead apron, which is this body apron. Uh, a thyroid shield, which is going around the neck and protects your thyroid. We have x-ray gloves right here, and we have lead x-ray goggles. So, um, you should know that lead PPE only protects from scatter radiation. Scatter radiation is the radiation that goes into the animal and then bounces off of them into the environment. Um, so that's what our PPE is protecting us from. That means that even if we place a shielded part of the body, so if I might have a hand inside a leg glove and I have it in that collimation of light in the primary beam, my hand is still getting x-ray exposure because the lead is not thick enough to protect from the primary beam. It's just protecting from scatter radiation, okay? So that means, so often in vet clinics, I don't know, it drives me nuts. People will sacrifice safety a lot in vet clinics, honestly. That's why this is such an important topic to me, um, because I feel like safety is so important. You can't keep doing your job if you aren't working safely, because you're gonna get injured or you're gonna get sick and you could even die. Um, so, you know, you're not helping any animals if you're dead. So anyways, lots of times you have maybe an uncooperative patient or um, you're trying to get a picture but it's a difficult shot to take. So um, you, you don't bother wearing your gloves because they're kind of clunky and they're difficult to manage. Um, and in that case, then your hands are definitely being exposed. 
I have seen people, so they're holding the animal's leg like this, and then they place the glove over the hand. Let me ask you then, is that glove protecting your hand from radiation that bounces out of that animal? No, it's not. Because the animal's here, it's gonna bounce into your hand here. The glove is here. You need that glove to protect you from the animal, right? So you have to be wearing gloves. You can't just place them on top of your hands. Um, lots of clinics are lazy about gloves. Everyone's gonna wear their lead apron and thyroid shield. That's a given, everyone does. But the gloves, lots of people are lazy about. And goggles. Lots of clinics don't have goggles. And if they do have goggles, lots of clinics are um, just, uh, they think they look nerdy. So for instance, I started working at Henderson Animal Hospital and I was working there for a couple months and then we had to do like a massive inventory. So we had to look through every single cupboard and document every piece of equipment we have. And lo and behold, so this first couple months I've been working, no, glo no goggles. Um, lo and behold, up in some shelf, dusty and hidden way at the back, I find a pair of lead goggles. I am so stoked because if you have no goggles on, your eyes are absorbing radiation and you're more likely to get cataracts. I do not want cataracts because I do not want to have to have uh, eye surgery. Cataract surgery is done on you awake with your eyes open and they're doing surgery on your eyes. No, thank you. I don't want that. I'm going to wear these goggles. So yes, they're terribly nerdy. These guys are actually pretty cool. The ones I found were like so nerdy. Um, but I started wearing them and everyone in the clinic teased me. They're like, oh, look at your goggles. And I was like, hey, safety is cool. I'm fine with it. I'm really happy to not have to have eye surgery later on. Enjoy your cataract surgery. And with time, everyone started wearing the goggles. And in fact, now we have a second set there so that everyone taking an x-ray can have goggles. So some clinics won't have them. I do not think it is unreasonable for you to demand them. If you are taking x-rays, you should be fully protected and I want my eyes protected. Uh, you can see too, this guy here has a V-trough. This is like a little foam um, bed kind of thing. It is radio, um, no, sorry, not radio opaque. It is radio lucent, which means that when you take an x-ray, you don't see it in the x-ray. Uh, it has little Velcro strips on the end. You can lay an animal in here and use those Velcro strips to keep their legs in place. He has here a sandbag. You can use that sandbag to hold their legs down or place it over their neck to hold their heads down. And you can take an x-ray hands-free. So using these kind of tools, you can place an animal so that you don't even have to be in the x-ray room with them while you take the picture. And in some cases, you might need to just sedate an animal to be able to get the correct shot. Uh, okay, so talking a little bit more about shielding, everyone involved in x-rays has to have their own personal dosimeter to measure their exposures to radiation. So in Canada, they look like this, the little dosimeters. They have a start date and an end date of when you wear them. And then they get mailed back to Health Canada and they send you new ones um, and you keep rotating through these. They measure how much radiation you're, you're absorbing. So these dosimeters are worn on the torso, so that's the body, uh, underneath the lead gown, and you only wear them when you're taking an x-ray. They should not be stored near an area where x-rays are taken, or obviously there's gonna be exposure on them. Um, and um, so basically I wear mine like in the little like, you know, if you're wearing a hoodie, there's like that little pouch pocket. Uh, my scrubs are like that. They have the little pouch. So I just put mine in my pocket when I'm taking an x-ray. Uh, so these measure how much radiation you've been exposed to. And Health Canada will uh, forbid you from doing any more x-rays if you reach a certain amount of exposure. That being said, I feel like I work very safely. I have never had an exposure on my dosimeter. So that's a good thing. Um, but basically, I want to really reiterate here that everyone should have their own dosimeter if they're asked to take x-rays. If you're working for a clinic that asks you to take x-rays without a dosimeter, um, they're basically telling you that they don't really care about you or your health. 
Um, so I would request one, I would demand one, and if they don't, I would refuse to take x-rays personally, because I think that when Health Canada has a monitoring system in place, that's telling us it's serious, and I think that the clinic should take it seriously too. I've seen some clinics just have like a blank one, and it or it's called guest, and they let people, let everyone share it, and they just have individual ones for the techs. I personally think that's a load of, uh, you know, horse poopy because um, everyone should be protected individually. These are linked to your SIN number so that there's, um, you know, so that, that that dose follows you for life. If you work at 10 different clinics, it will track through all 10. So it's important, I think, to have one of these. And then lead equipment. We need to make sure we're taking care of our lead equipment to protect uh, ourselves. So they need to be hung up. So like this, we need to have them hanging on some kind of thing so that they're laying flat. If you just have a bunch of crap piled up, you are gonna get cracks in your lead. Um, and then x-ray equipment should be x-rayed at least yearly to look for any cracks in the lead. Um, and usually the techs do that. Okay, so our next potential risk is laser. So if you work in a place that has a uh, therapeutic laser or perhaps a surgical laser, um, there is a risk of eye damage. So uh, you remember those like laser pointers, people play with them with the cats or they would use them to like point things um, on presentations. It's the same kind of idea how you're not supposed to uh, put those into your eyes. Uh, so you could have eye damage with laser. So one way to prevent that damage is placing warning signs on the doors of the closed room where laser is in use. Laser should not be used out in the open. It should be done in a closed and separate room. You should have, if you have like stainless steel tables, you should have a towel over the table to prevent the laser from reflecting on like the shiny table. Um, and we should all be wearing eye protection. So there's special laser goggles uh, and there's goggles for the humans and the pet. So I always, I always say that laser is our cutest treatment because they all get to wear these little goggles that uh, I'm not lying, they're called doggles. How cute is that? <laughs> so we wanna make sure we're wearing those safety glasses. We have extra sets for owners in the room. If the owner wants to come in and be with the pet, they need to wear the safety glasses as well. Um, I just clean them in between every use so that they have like a fresh clean pair to wear. And um, if they refuse, then I refuse to have them in the room because it is a safety issue. So let's talk about facility hazards. These are kind of just general hazards that could happen anywhere, but and definitely do happen in the vet clinic. So if there are wet floors, maybe an animal has peed on the floor or you just freshly mopped, you could slip. If there's excessive noise levels, which I tell you, some dogs get barking and it is like piercing in your ears, that can cause hearing damage. If you have poor air quality in the clinic, you could end up with some respiratory illness or headaches. Poor lighting will cause trip and fall injuries, or if it's outdoors, uh, it could be contributing to violence or criminal activity. Uh, you know, light scares off criminals, right? They don't wanna be seen. And um, electrical misuse can cause fire or shocks. So let's break this down. So prevention wise, if you got a wet floor, post the wet floor sign. And as a general rule, just don't run in the hospital. You're more likely to slip and fall if you're running. Uh, when noise levels are really high, it's a good idea to have some ear protection. So you can have over the ear uh, noise canceling headphones or you can use inside the ear um, uh, earplugs. So that's a great way to kind of reduce that noise level. Um, and if you do have a dog that's just barking incessantly, try to move them into a separate closed room because at least you can close the door and it'll muffle it a bit. So ventilation wise, we want to make sure we have good ventilation. Uh, I'm going to talk more about anesthetic stuff when we talk about anesthetic gases, but we need to make sure that anesthetic machines are being leak tested and that we're testing our scavenger systems as well. Again, I'll explain that more uh, in a couple minutes when we talk about um, anesthetic gas. We want to make sure we have adequate lighting. So, you know, change your burnt out light bulbs. If there isn't a light, put a light in. I'll tell you right now. Again, working at Henderson Animal Hospital, if you're not familiar with that place or its location, it's right beside a bar. Um, and 
when we close, often it is dark out, especially in winter. And um, there's rowdies at the bar. Like people have definitely been stabbed at that bar. Um, I'm not going outside in the back alley with no light fixture in the back to take out the garbage. I just don't do it. I leave it and I'll take it out in the morning. So, um, you know, be safe. If you do have areas that aren't adequately lit, don't go in them in the dark. And then um, if you have any damaged areas in your hospital, those areas should be repaired right away so that no one gets injured in them. And of course, electrical outlets. We need to be careful we are not overloading our electrical outlets. It can start a fire. And if you are using extension cords in the clinic, they're for temporary use only. Extension cords should not be a permanent solution. Okay, so fire is a risk. And if you're thinking, oh, I'm sure that doesn't happen. Uh, this is a equine vet that was completely destroyed by fire and killed a number of horses as well. This is not local. Uh, I just wanted to have an example for you that it can happen. There are a lot of fire hazards in the vet clinic. So we want to make sure we're being careful about fire stuff. <coughs> so there's the potential of injury to people or pets. There's the potential of loss of property or life as well, which obviously we do not want. So for prevention, we want to make sure we're participating in regular fire inspections. This is always a favorite day in uh, the clinics I've worked at <coughs> because the firefighters come to inspect the clinic and all the single ladies in the clinic are like, oh, hi, do you want me to give you the tour? So it's always a, always a fun one for the single ladies. Um, the, and I suppose if you have any, uh, you know, maybe men that are uh, into men, then they would be excited as well. <laughs> Um, and then fire extinguishers should be on site and they should be in high potential fire areas. So for instance, in the surgery room where you have uh, oxygen tanks, you should have a fire extinguisher. Um, if you have like a kitchen area or the autoclave, that's a good area to have a fire extinguisher as well. Uh, so how do you use a fire extinguisher? So we want to remember the acronym PASS when we're thinking about fire extinguishers. P is for pull the pin. A is for aim the nozzle at the base of the fire. So up here is not where we're gonna put out the fire, it's at the base. And then we wanna squeeze the lever and then sweep from side to side to put out that fire. So that's PASS, P-A-S-S. -S. Uh, for fire prevention, we also wanna make sure we have an evacuation plan posted. Uh, this is uh, I'm guessing maybe some kind of school because it says like classroom or whatever. I couldn't find a good uh, vet clinic example to show you, but you should have labeled on there where the fire extinguishers are. Uh, so here's some examples here. There's like an ax, there's whatever, there's different um, symbols there. Um, and you should have written on there where any compressed gas, so oxygen is located. Um, and you should have your evacuation plan written on the evacuation as well. So, you know, gather animals in kennels or leashes, take to pay, uh, staff cars, call 911, that kind of thing. You should have smoke detectors in the clinic and they should be tested every six months minimum. Uh, you wanna make sure you're not blocking exits and remember that your furnace room is not a storage area. Lots of vet clinics tend to not have a lot of storage space, so they just cram things places. So um, the furnace room is not one of those places you should be cramming things. Um, I remember starting at Henderson Animal Hospital and opening up the furnace room and being like, why is there so much paint stored in here? Because uh, I guess every time they've had the clinic painted, they kept all the old paint and stored it in the furnace room. It's just not safe. Don't do things like that. Okay, so another potential um, safety factor is violence, uh, potentially from clients, coworkers, or criminals. So obviously the risk is injury, um, it, physical injury and emotional injury, right? If I was attacked by a client, I feel like that would be, uh, that would weigh heavily on me. Uh, so prevention, we wanna have a total zero tolerance policy for workplace violence. So if any coworker gets violent with any other coworker, they're fired, the end. Um, you should learn de-escalation techniques for upset clients. We kind of talked about that already, right? With our, um, like that Texas approach, right? For dealing with disgruntled clients. 
And then if you do have an upset client, go ahead and get back up. Uh, people with a w witness are much less likely to get to the violent stage. And then um, we want to employ security measures to deter criminals. Having things like a security system, um, like uh, closed circuit cameras, uh, alarm, etc. You should have a camera um, and recording devices, uh, perimeter lighting, making sure things are adequately lit, and having deadbolts on the doors. Uh, that can deter criminals. Um, compressed gases are a threat in the clinic as well. Uh, so there's going to be oxygen tanks uh, in probably every single clinic and a few clinics do have nitrous oxide. Not every clinic, I think there's only a couple that still use it, uh, but they do potentially have those as well. So compressed gases are an explosion risk and oxygen is an accelerant to fire. So if there's a fire near the oxygen tanks, it's going to make that fire go much, much faster. Um, so to prevent any issues with our compressed gas, we want to make sure the tanks are always chained to the wall. We do not unchain them to clean around them or to move them around ourselves. Only the trained um, like oxygen tank handling people are going to handle those tanks. We're not going to move them around at all. Okay, and our next topic is anesthetic gas. So there are some risks from breathing in anesthetic gases, even in low doses. You could see birth defects if you're pregnant. It could cause spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. Uh, it can cause cancer. That's pretty extreme, but it's possible. More likely, you're gonna be irritable, depressed, and have a headache. So we can prevent exposure to anesthetic gas by making sure that our anesthetic machines are leak tested before every single use. Um, this is something I think probably a lot of techs get lazy about. I don't think it's unreasonable to just say, hey, did you leak test the anesthetic machine? And then um, they can be like, oh yeah, I know I should be doing that, but I'm not. You're right, I'm cutting a safety corner. Uh, but they should be leak tested every single time. It takes like 10 seconds. It's not hard to do. Um, we should be checking our scavenger systems regularly for damage, which means that they could be leaking or blockages, which means the gases aren't getting out. So the scavenger system is the series of hoses that collect all the waste anesthetic gas and take it outdoors to vent outside. Um, if those hoses get damaged, they could be leaking. Um, or what happens often um, in my last clinic, the scavenger system exits to outside and in the winter we would get like ice blockage over it. So we'd have to go outside and chip the ice away because uh, the scavenger system wasn't taking the gases outside. And then when we're doing anesthetic, we always wanna make sure that our uh, endotracheal tubes fit properly and that they have inflated cuffs. Uh, we will check to make sure that there is no leaking around the tube. We'll often get you guys to help with that and I'll teach you how to do it when we're talking in um, veterinary nursing. Uh, but we want to make sure that that is in place to protect us from a waste anesthetic gas coming from the animal. And then if possible, we want to avoid mask and chamber inductions. Again, I'll talk more about that in like restraint and nursing, uh, but both of those end up exposing us to a lot of anesthetic gas. So chemical and drug exposures are a factor in vet clinics. We have a lot of cleaning chemicals around. We're using bleaches, we're using peroxides, we're using alcohol. All those things are really damaging to the skin. Um, there's potential to have chemotherapy drugs around. If you're still using um, like, a, I guess, analog um, x-rays, if you don't have digital x-ray, you might still be developing radiograph film. And in which case you would have all the chemicals around for that. There's lots of chemicals in the lab that are really dangerous, like formalin. Uh, formalin's a kind of formaldehyde that um, can cause cancer. Glutaraldehyde can cause cancer. Uh, there's lots of stains which can damage the skin. Lots of drugs can be absorbed through the skin if you're touching them and handling them, and that's dangerous. Uh, and then flea premises spray or other pesticides. So the health risks, you could have skin burns uh, from handling the items directly with your skin. Um, you could have respiratory illness from breathing in the aerosols. Uh, some of them are carcinogenic. Some will cause tissue damage. Some could cause miscarriage. And then there's physical risks as well. Some might be flammable or reactive with other chemicals or explosive or corrosive. 
So for prevention, we always want to read the label or the SDS. So we should have SDSs for all the chemicals and drugs in the building. We want to make sure that we're reading those, that we know how to uh, handle the chemical that we're using. So I have a for instance for you. Uh, again, when I started working at Henderson Animal Hospital, we were using this, um, this cleaning product called Clinicide. Clinicide is just a terrible cleaning product. It stains everything pink. I don't know why you'd want to use it. But anyway, we would use it and we'd use it in a bucket with a sponge and we'd clean things with it. And then one day I was reading the label and it says on there that you should be wearing gloves to uh, use this chemical. And no one had told me that. And uh, no one was using gloves in the clinic. But because uh, not only is it damaging to your skin, it was a carcinogen. Great, thanks for that. So always make sure you read the label and know how to handle the chemical that you're using. We also don't wanna mix chemicals. You guys have probably heard about mixing bleach and ammonia. I'm pretty sure it makes like mustard gas. Uh, and then we wanna make sure we have absolutely no food in or drink in the lab or the pharmacy and we shouldn't be eating or drinking or storing food and beverages near chemicals and drugs. That means that your lunch fridge, like in the lunchroom, shouldn't have any drugs in there at all. It should be just food. Uh, we should also make sure for safety to have an eye wash station uh, and possibly even a uh, shower available. And they should be tested regularly. Nothing worse than going to flush your eyes and um, the eye wash station not working or have not been used for so long that it's got like all those crusty deposits in it that are now in your eye. So those things should be flushed out at least weekly. And then of course, we wanna make sure we're not handling drugs or chemicals with bare hands if we're not supposed to. Drugs for sure, just don't handle any drugs with bare hands and lots of chemicals we shouldn't be either. So we should make sure we're using the proper PPE. So gloves, definitely. You may even need a mask, you may even need goggles. And then I just have et cetera, if you need like booties, gloves and biohazard waste bags for things like chemotherapy. So in conclusion, you are always entitled to a safe work environment. And I wanna stress that even if it's busy, you are entitled to safe work. So in the vet clinic, sometimes it gets really busy, really hairy. People wanna rush, rush, rush through things. Um, often with animals, you have a really small window to get things done because they just don't have a lot of tolerance. That doesn't mean you should cut corners on safety. If you really cannot handle an animal um, enough to like get that x-ray or whatever, uh, we should be looking at sedation rather than um, us working unsafe. So I do encourage you, please do be an advocate for safety, safety for you, safety for others. Call people out if they're not working in a safe manner um, and bring attention to like the higher ups if there are things that are lacking in terms of safety in your workplaces. I think what happens is people end up doing their job for a long time and they don't see something bad happen. So they just kind of get complacent, but we should never be complacent about safety. So, um, if you aren't working safely, you're not gonna be working for long, right? And um, I think we all, I think you guys are all here because you want a long and fulfilling career. So if you're working safely, then you can hopefully achieve that, right? And then, so I have remember, uh, safety is cool, right? That, that's like my slogan. That's my, my thing to say is safety is cool. We should all be working really safe and making sure that we are not injuring ourselves or other people that we're working with or our patients. All right. Okay, so that's everything I have to talk to you guys about safety. I really hope I've inspired you to work in a safe manner. Um, it really drives me nuts when people take unnecessary risks. Um, like if someone, uh, if it was like re really obvious, like with radiation, let's say, if you take an x-ray today with no PPE on, it's not like tomorrow you're going to have cancer, right? It's this long-term overtime buildup of radiation that can cause the problems. Um, and unfortunately, people just kind of don't think that way. If they're not immediately punished with some kind of consequence, they just assume it's going to be okay. But if I asked you every time you took an x-ray without goggles, hey, do you want cataracts? Your answer is never going to be yes. But if you're not wearing gloves, it's certainly possible for you to get those. Uh, I said gloves, but I meant goggles. Um, if you're not wearing gloves while you take x-rays, you could get skin cancer in your hands, right? So 
just don't take the risks. Make sure you're working safely um, so that you can have like a long and fulfilling career in this field. Okay, so if you do have any questions about safety or any of the risks in the animal hospital, do please reach out to me. I'm available in the chat. Uh, I'm available in the virtual classroom and I'm always available by email as well. So please do reach out if you do have any questions. Thank you so much. Bye.